Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome this morning. Uh, I, I want to talk about some multiple raptures again. I, I want to talk about in deeper detail about specifically uh, the first two harvest, the pre-trib uh, harvest or rapture of the bride and the mid-trib harvest of the church that has been in large left behind. And I will, I will cover this in detail, but in this most awesome way, uh, Brother Lori, it's good to see you. Please, anyone that hears this, please come on in. Um, God gave me another dream this last night, and it, it was because I am, and like many of you, brothers and sisters, I want to see, I, I want to be this encouragement. I I want to uh, have the opportunity to lift everyone up, to, to, to just be filled with this hopeful expectation of Jesus' imminent return for his bride. And uh, I do believe that's the case. And I believe that he tells me or has told me various things. I have gotten a lot of God dreams. Now I have dreams just like regular folks. I mean, you know, just like anyone else. Um, uh, but there are, and I've talked about these God dreams that I have been given and, uh, and that I am getting at a much higher pace, I think, as of late. But even with the confirmations and those types of things that happen, I still want to, like, when is it going to happen? <laughs> Come on now. You, you, you're killing me. Come on. Let me, let me know. I know how close it is. And I know uh, how... Uh, Hold on just a second. I was just reminded of something. Uh, okay. And that is the... Bear with me just a moment. I have just gotten a, a message. And... Uh, ah! Yes, thank you. Thank you, Abba. Uh, hold on just a second, folks. I have just... Uh, Give me just a second, and I want, uh, uh, let's see, I want to get out something else here, and that is dealing with rapture timing, okay? Uh, let me do this quickly uh, so that, yes, 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 yes. All right, so let me quickly print this out. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, that's really the way things happen. Okay. Um, what happens is sometimes revelation comes when you least expect it. Right. And so I just had another one and I want to print this out so that you will then know about it as well, okay? So that's, the, oh my goodness. Woo. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, that's an empty page, that didn't help so much, but oh, awesome. And that is specifically what we're gonna deal with, the rapture timing and the question about, does God actually give us rapture timing? Well, I believe so. 
I believe so, right? Uh, and I'm going to cover that here in a minute. Okay, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Oh, so amazing. So amazing. Uh, let's see. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Ah, awesome. Amazing. All right. So let's get back to it. Wow. That's just, you know, there's no telling when revelation or prompting of Holy Spirit is going to come to you. And that was just, you just saw it here, folks. I just had something really big just popped into my spirit right at that moment. Oh, oh, oh. And I see just how uh, amazing that is going to be. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, let's, let's, before we get into this, I'm going to cover this dream that I had as I was talking about before Holy Spirit just came in and, and dropped this awesome thing into my spirit uh, on rapture timing. Interesting. Okay, because we get a little piece, a little piece, a little piece. Now, right now we've got you know, all kinds of pieces being dropped all at the same time, and they're being picked up everywhere. If uh, everyone uh, has seen uh, Dr. Barry Oz latest, he just put out part four of three. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I was watching that early, early, early in the morning for me, okay, being in Australia. Thank you, Emma. Um, and I was not able to sleep after I awoke from this dream, this God dream, and I was awake for hours, and I was praying, and I was seeking uh, wisdom from the Lord and that sort of thing, and all of that for hours until 5.30 this morning, and then I was able to get another hour of sleep. And in that hour of sleep, I had yet another dream in which the Lord was just telling me in that dream about how he is going to tell me, meaning us people, his people, about when the harvest is going to take place. I have no doubt he is going to do that. And if you want to hold on to and not let go of uh, the, uh, the scripture in Mark and Matthew, which says no man knows the day or the hour, and then you want to associate that with the rapture, which it does not, and, and, and it's very easy to see that it does not. That's why I just, I have a difficulty in understanding. Why would you so vociferously argue, no man knows the day or the hour. No man knows. Jesus doesn't even know himself. Oh, he couldn't possibly know. Because, and only the Father knows. You know, and, and I'm thinking like, it is so simple when you read the scripture, you see that it's not even talking about a rapture or harvest event when that scripture is given. So I've always been struck by this, wondering what is the real meaning behind that? In other words, what is the real meaning for the people that hold on to that? Do they do they just not want to see it? Do they truly not see it? Is it for real? Uh, or is there another reason for it? Uh, one of the things that, that we know, and I think that that's really probably the case, is that the groups have been separated out. And by those groups, I mean the harvest groups based on what you which group you belong into. And I, uh, I am of the strong conviction that Holy Spirit reveals 
to each person in that specific group exactly what they need to know and understand that is fit for the person in that particular group. And, uh, and, and I think that is the case. There is a progressive revelation that takes place throughout the Bible. And we know that, or I hope that we all realize and understand that the book that was sealed in Daniel has been opened, unsealed, and all of this revelation is coming out of that. And we see that. All right, let's, uh, let's get into this. Let's get into this. Let me start with a, with a prayer because I just, the Holy Spirit is really strong on me and, and I just want to be able to, I want to be able to do this in such a way that hopefully it's only about an hour this time, okay? Uh, but it's definitely something that I think that we want to see. All right. Dear Abba, our heavenly Father, I'm just so thankful for you. I am. I want to lift you up, praise you, worship you, adore you, give you all of my adoration, all of my worship and praise. And I and I ask that you give us all a heart for you, all a heart for you that pours every part of our being into lifting you up and to lifting Jesus high above all things, because he is so close to coming. And, and I am just, I, I'm so excited about it. And I'm asking for you to cover our hearts, minds, and our spirits with your precious cleansing, brother, Lord Jesus, and, and that, that you will calm us, that you will reveal to us what your word means at a deeper meaning, at a deeper level, and that you are going to draw more people just quickly, quickly, quickly in this last moment, draw those that belong to you before that trumpet sounds. I ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, let's let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. I know that there is some pushback and 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 I don't know if it's rightfully so. I believe that it is definitely something that I'm not going to say that what I'm saying is the do all and end all. I am asking for you to be able to listen consider, look into the scripture and see for yourself. Ask for Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and lead you in that, uh, um, in that effort. But I am thinking, and this is, I'm just going to tell you what the Lord is showing me. And, and there's so much here. There's so much here. And I believe that one of the very first things that he revealed to me when I was in his presence, praise you, praise you, praise you, dear Jesus. When I was in his presence, he showed me there was more than one group that was going to be harvested. And, and, and I use the term harvest because he showed me from the harvest model, his harvest model that he has in his word, everything that I am trying to relate to you, I connect with his word. And I'm hoping that you will look at it and compare it yourselves and that you will consider it as well look in there and see if you don't see these same things, okay? All right, and that is, what are these things that I'm talking about? It's that there are multiple harvests, that there is a pre-tribulation harvest or rapture event. There is a mid-tribulation harvest or rapture event, and there is a post-tribulation harvest or rapture event. And now, in those, one of the first things that you have to think of is why? I, I mean, 
why, why do we see that? So uh, let's say that you are of the mindset that, well, I, I have seen and I believe based upon what my pastor has taught me for the last 20, 30, 40, you know, put a number in there, okay, number of years, and I believe that this is what it is. There is a pre-trib only single harvest event. That is what the resurrection is and so on and so forth, right? Okay. Or maybe you just got like, uh, clearly when you read Matthew 24, it says after the tribulation of those days and that type of thing, okay? And, uh, and so they say, you can see just at this particular level that there is a harvest event that happens there. And you've heard that there are other groups uh, that deal with a mid-trib or maybe they uh, might call it a pre-wrath or, you know, those types of things. But what I'm trying to point out is that people are seeing deeper into God's word and they're saying like, wait a minute. I'm seeing something else here. And this, this appears when you look at it and you really don't just like, oh, no, 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 I can't mean that. I can't mean that. Just read God's word and say, okay, what does that mean? What does it mean to me? What are you trying to show me, Abba? I want to know. I want to know your word. I want to know you, Jesus, and know you through your word. Okay. And one of the things that I think is that how great is the mercy and grace of our God. That he not only, he, he doesn't just go like, all right, everybody line up. All right, you and you, you're going. Okay, come over here. Everybody else, bah! I'm just going to toss you aside. No, no, that's not the way it are of all works. He loves this world. And, and he loves the people in the world. He doesn't love what's happening in the world. He doesn't love the sin of the world, of course. But he loves people. And he wants to save and redeem. He wants to bring as many to himself uh, that that you know, that he, he's just trying to do it. And how would he be able to do this? Uh, and uh, it, the, the, the problem is that, or as I see it, I just see that his grace and mercy shows all of the ways that in the different types of people that he has a way to be able to draw them to make an impact in their lives and to show them what the truth is and to give them an opportunity. He continues to give opportunities and he will all the way down to the very end of the tribulation period. One of the greatest, and how do, how do we know that? Because at the very end of the tribulation period, up to this point, Man has been given this great, awesome privilege to preach his word, to tell people about Jesus, to tell people about his coming. And at this late hour, at the very end, when there's no one left, then he even gets angels to do it. He's, he's, he's not wanting anybody to miss out on this opportunity. So that's what he does. Even at the very end, he still wants to try to save that very last person. That's the grace and mercy of our God. All right. So he also then shows that there are three harvests uh, that we can identify out of the harvest model in the scripture, okay? And uh, so a pre-trib harvest and a mid-trib harvest and a post-trib harvest. Now, one of the things that I want to uh, mention, of course, as far as about the, uh, uh, the way that 
I have grown deeper in this understanding is that the pre-trib harvest is the bride. It's only the bride, but let me clearly delineate the bride is not the church. Now, understand, the bride is part of the church. The church is the body of Christ. Okay, that's the whole thing, the whole body, right? But there are members in particular, and the bride is a member of the body. And the bride, which is taken out of the body, is going to be harvested and taken up and out first. That's the pre-trib harvest, okay? We'll, we'll cover this more into detail. The mid-tribulation harvest is the church at large. That is the, the rest, the, what we affectionately known as the left behind church. Well, and, and so there's a lot of persons that, you know, just get all humphrey and, you know, humphy and puffy about it, saying like, get, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to listen to you because the church is not going to be left behind. Everybody goes. And, and I'm saying, if you will just stop and listen to this, no, that's not the case. Just willingly, you know, sticking your fingers in your ears, going, no, 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 I can't hear you. Blah, 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 blah. That does not help. That doesn't help you at all, because I believe that what God is trying to do is he's trying to talk to you. He's trying to talk to you. And there are so many watchmen out there that are trying to show you, to tell you, to reveal to you certain things hoping that it's going to make an impression on you, that you won't harden your heart to these things, right? And then that's what we've got, Russell. Yes, that is true. That is true. And that's what we say. Each one of these harvests, the bride, the left behind church, and the unbelieving Jews, and we use this in a general sense, there, there, there are little pieces and parts that... Uh, that may cross over and that sort of thing. But the synoptic gospels are tied to these as well. And uh, so the pre-tribulation harvest of the bride, where do we see that audience, right? Well, the whole Bible is beneficial for instruction. But when we look at the audience for particular groups, not every book was written to everyone, right? It's written for everyone, but it wasn't written to everyone. So what we say then is the book of Luke is written to the bride. It's written for everyone, but it's written to the bride. So we can see a particular audience and what this means, because there are differences that we see in the synoptic gospels, the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay? And they parallel in so many ways, but then we, we have these things that are differences, and those differences and how they match up to these different groups is very powerful and revealing. So Luke is written to the bride. Mark is written to the left behind church. And Matthew is written to the uh, unbelieving Jews, okay? And this is what, what I'm trying to say is that, and, and, and why do we say that? Well, Matthew comes first in our Bible, right? Matthew first, Mark in the second, and Luke last. <clears throat> But don't we say that, what, doesn't Jesus tell us that the last shall be first and the first shall be last? So if you read this pre, mid, and post, Luke, Mark, Matthew, the last is first. That's Luke. That is the bride, okay? Now, uh, I want to tell you first about the dream that I had that relates 
to this because that if I don't, it is so important to me to be able to tell you with as, as clear a, uh, you know, without anything from me, right? I, I, I want to give the message as, as clearly as I understand it uh, to be able to tell our brothers and sisters. And so this is what happened last night. And oh my goodness, another rapture dream. Now this is very interesting in the way this played out. And it was, it was so real, so real as God dreams are. <coughs> Excuse me. So without going into a lot of detail, I become aware that I am in this huge room and it's a, a white room and I am uh, sitting at the feet of several other people. Everyone is dressed in white, okay? And while I, I am not given to understand specifics here, I knew that I was being taught these things, that there was, I was, I was being trained, I was being instructed. And, uh, and this instruction was to be used for other brothers and sisters. Now, like I said, I don't know what it was at that time, but I knew that what I was doing was being instructed. Now, I didn't know who these other uh, people were that, that were there, but I was being instructed. Now, here's the, the, the neat thing. Once I recognized that I had the full instruction that was for me personally. So in other words, this is what I see is going to happen. It was just representative of a just a regular person, right? Each one of the pre-tribulation harvest, harvested bride members will be instructed personally and you will use this personal instruction in your unique way of, I guess, your part of being the bride. You're, you're being able to teach, instruct, or however that's going to work. I don't know very much. Again, this is just from the dream standpoint. Okay. Once I have received all of the instruction that I need, then I get up, right? And I am looking and suddenly I am, uh, it's like, oh, how do I say this? The instruction was like a movie presentation up for it's like I had attended a screening or a, a movie right and so I looked in my hand and I had a white ticket stub and this white ticket stub I was looking at it and I said it's so important. I, I have already seen the movie, right? I have already attended the screening. And so I took this and I put this in my pocket, which was right here. And I, you know, I wanted to keep it. It was very important to me. And so then I walked to this door and it's it's a huge door 
And I know that what is happening, and it's this huge wall, and the it's so big that I can't see the ends of it either way that I look. But I know that through this door, there is the second group that is just about to see their movie, okay? So they are in a screening. So I'm wanting to go in there and view to see it, to kind of spy it out, if you will, right? So the interesting thing is, I don't open up a door. This is a big, huge, closed door. I walked right through the door, just like I was supposed to. And then I'm in this enormous room, another enormous room. And what I see is in this room, it's very dark. It's why? I, because it's it's like a theater, right? And uh, and so the the lights are off, and uh, everyone is facing this screen. All right, so it's like being in this theater, but this theater you've never seen anything like it. It was astronomically large. There were so many people in there and you can't make any of them out. They're all in dark clothing and they're all sitting in there and they're all watching this movie. But what I can see is I can see this reflection of the light from the screen that is being cast on them. And they are all watching it. And I'm looking as far as I can see and as wide as I can see, and there's just uncountable numbers of people that are there. And my thought that comes to me is, this is the great harvest and what they are in for, right? And so then once I recognize this and I look at this, then I just kind of acknowledge that. And then I turn around and walk back through the door, just like I did, walk back through the door into my side, right? And I knew it was my side. All right. So here's the, here's the issue that, and, and I'm thinking like, all right, all right, and I check, once again, make sure my white ticket stub is still there, right? And it is, and then I wake up. Now, here is, and I was immediately given the, uh, the understanding of what this dream meant, okay? And, uh, and it should be, uh, hopefully, you know, obvious to a lot of you, but what I was is I was part of the first harvest, the bride harvest. Everyone is in this, in white, right? We're all dressed in white and we're all having, uh, and, and we are learning. I, I had this image that I was learning at the feet of Jesus, right? Except that there are other people, but I was there. I was sitting down, right, and uh, and uh, I was at their feet. So that's the that's the impression that I got, and so there was that instruction there. Well, so what happens then is uh, I I recognize that after the instruction or the preparation of what we are going to do, what the bride is going to be tasked with doing. Uh, that's when I get up, right? And so the thing with the ticket, it, it's, it's, it was a ticket, well, we know, right? Everybody has gotten their ticket to appear, right? 
you can't enter. You can't be uh, able to enter unless you have a ticket. Well, I have this ticket and it's a white ticket. And it made me think about the white stone, of course, that, uh, you know, in uh, Revelation chapter three, we're going to cover that a, a little bit later. But these little things, but I recognized and it was the stub. So in other, in other words, I had already attended. So in other words, the pre-trib harvest had already taken place. I was a part of that. And I put it in my pocket that is right next to my heart. It was something that is very important to me, right? And that's what I want to keep it, my heart, my heart for Jesus. The bride has a heart for Jesus, a heart of love and adoration for Jesus, right? And what was interesting then, as I walked through the door, what this doorway represented and this wall was the separation from uh, the heavenly world into the uh, 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 physical world. And so this physical world, when, when I go in, I see all of those that are going to be part of the second harvest. Well, it's not yet, right? Because it's after uh, the pre-tribulation harvest, then the mid-tribulation harvest is not going to take place until after they have gone through their theater, right? Their showing their presentation. That's what they have to do. They have to go through this time period that, uh, that, and it's not until that time period for their showing it is complete. And that's when their harvest is going to take place. And uh, the reason why I'm looking at it and it's so huge is because it is the number that no one can count. It was uncountable. It, it was incredibly huge, but so much bigger than the bridal harvest, right? And so that's that's one of the things that I want to uh, kind of point out. And so that was then, once I looked at that and I recognized that, then I went back into my side because <clears throat> That's where I'm going to be. That's the idea. That's where I belonged while they were going through their presentation. Do you understand? So I think that that's what that was. And I awoke. I was just like, you know, breathing hard. It was like so, so impactful to me. And I'm thinking like, wow, wow, wow. All right, let's talk about this then. Was that all three? No, it was just to show me the grain harvest, okay? I wanna uh, go in and let's talk about these harvest and let's talk about a little bit more about the, the book of Hosea, chapter two. I, I wanna do that in, the, in my last message, I discussed uh, in, uh, out of Hosea, uh, another part talking about the uh, prostitutes on the threshing floor. And as I discussed more about the book of Ruth, if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to see my last message. But it, uh, I was prompted by Dr. Barry to be able to follow this up with something. And I love Dr. Barry. I love all of our watchmen. I love all of our brothers and sisters. And I just love how we are shuffling the cards together, as it were, to make one complete deck or putting the puzzle pieces in place, right? So we've got all these pieces. And so some of these pieces that we look at, we look at and we go, like, oh, I think it goes in this spot. And then we go, like, oh, well, it looks like, yeah, it doesn't quite fit. Well, let me set this aside and let's go to another piece, right? That one works, okay? <clears throat> and so... That is what happens a lot of times. Well, I want to give you a screen capture about uh, this one thing that we're going to go in and we're going to cover, uh, hopefully quickly, from the Word of God, because we tie everything to the Word of God. Amen? 
Amen. Amen. All right. So let's get this. I want you to be able to. There we go. All right. Okay. So what's what I want to do, that was out of, I, I'm sorry, Dr. Barry, if you see that, that's not the most flattering picture of you, I know, but that's that's what I got at the time. He's praising, he's teaching, he's doing so well, and I just love Dr. Barry to death, and, uh, or shall I say, love Dr. Barry to life. There we go, because he is teaching on the words of life, right? That is our Lord Jesus. All right. Now, the reason why I, I highlighted this is because he is showing, and, and it's one of the things, of course, uh, Dr. Barry also had pointed out the same thing as, as I have been always pointing out. There are multiple raptures. And he pointed out, out of Hosea chapter 2, this one particular uh, scriptural reference here in which he says, points to uh, the rapture as he's got it there. Uh, and I tend to agree, but I want to go a little bit farther because I think that there's some really deep nuggets here that I want to just ferret out. All right. And so what he has there is he highlights, therefore I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season, the moed. And, uh, and, and he's saying that that relates to the rapture. Now, I want to point out something here at the top, too. It says, for she did not know that I gave her wheat, new wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prefer, prepared for Baal. Now, that, that kind of struck me as odd because I went and I checked uh, uh, and, and, and this was, I wondered why I was like, I don't remember that being wheat listed there. And I actually checked and I found only one version, one translation that had the word wheat there. And that's the Lamsa uh, translation from the Aramaic. And so I didn't know which particular one that, uh, I didn't know if this was the translation that Dr. Barry was using, but in this particular instance, the word I believe is grain. Okay, so we're going to go. The, uh, hold on to your your hats, brothers and sisters. We're going to go in there and we're going to cover this in deeper detail. Right? Okay. So that was out of the uh, Hosea two chapter, or excuse me, Hosea chapter 2, verses 4 through 11. That's what Dr. Barry has noticed here. But what I want to do is I want to read you the entire first part, the, the first 13 verses of Hosea chapter 2, because I want to pull out even more here, okay? Because I not only see the multiple raptures, but I also see a connection with the final church, the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. And hold on to your hats on this. I think, that, oh, yes, thank you, Abba. All right. And how the church of Laodicea follows the church of Philadelphia. In other words, Philadelphia is the raptured church, right? The pre-trib raptured church, but then the Laodicean church, ooh, definitely left behind, okay? Along with the, with the others, and we'll see this. But let me read out of Hosea chapter two, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read out of the Amplified Bible for the purpose of trying to ferret out some of these other uh, uh, words and the deeper meanings in some of these word connections that I think is so important that we don't necessarily get otherwise, okay? And uh, so let's start. Hosea chapter 2, uh, and this is dealing, the first half deals with Israel's unfaithfulness and them being condemned. 
<clears throat> All right. Hosea, say to your brothers, Ami, you are my people. And to your sisters, Ruhama, you have been pitied and have obtained mercy. Contend with your mother nation. Contend, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. And have her remove her marks of prostitution from her face, and her adultery from between her breasts. Or I will strip her naked and expose her as on the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and slay her with thirst. Also, I will have no mercy on her children, because they are the children of prostitution. For their mother has played the prostitute. She who convinced them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will pursue my lovers who gave me my food and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my refreshing drinks. Therefore, behold, I, the Lord God, will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her, shutting off her way so that she cannot find her paths. She will passionately pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them, and she will seek them, but will not find them. Then she will say, let me go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. For she, Israel, has not noticed, nor understood, nor realized that it was I, the Lord God, who gave her the grain and the new wine and the oil and lavished on her silver and gold which they used for Baal and made into his image. Then verse nine, therefore I will return and take back my grain at harvest time and my new wine in its season. I will also take away my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. And now I will uncover her lewdness and shame in the sight of her lovers, and no one will rescue her from my hand. Verse 11, I will also put an end to all her rejoicing, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her festivals. I will destroy her vines and her fig trees. <coughs> Excuse me of which she has said, these are my wages, which my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the animals of the open country will devour them. And I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals, when she used to offer sacrifices and burn incense to them, and adorn herself with her earrings and nose rings and her jewelry, and follow her lovers so that she forgot me, says the Lord. Then from verse 14 on is the restoration of Israel. But I want to stop right here because what I want to do is I want to go back, <coughs> excuse me, and cover <sighs> thank you, Abba. I want to cover some uh, highlights out of these that I want to then relate over to the book of Revelation. And you think like, wow, how is that possible? Okay, well, here we go. Well, I want to highlight first verse 3. Or I will strip her naked and expose her on the day she was born. I will make her like a wilderness and make her like a parched land and slay her with thirst. Now, I want you to highlight the thirst, and the nakedness, okay? Then in verse 5, oh, wow, this is so cool. For their mother has played the prostitute, 
So she who convinced them has acted shamefully, for she said, I will pursue my lovers who give me my food and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my refreshing drinks. Okay. Now, what we're going to see, I, I want you to highlight again the dealing with the uh, the clothes. So, what we're going to see out of the uh, Book of Revelation, chapter three, when we discuss the Church of Laodicea, is we're going to talk about the the church being naked. And, uh, and about the church not being a refreshing drink. But we're we're going to cover that. Hold on. Being hot or cold, we want to talk about that. Uh, that's what they're talking about, the water that come, flows through uh, Laodicea being lukewarm. We'll cover that in a minute. But what it talks about, my wool and my flax, they use that to make white clothing, okay? And we're going to talk about the white raiment, right? Because that's what the Church of Laodicea is asked to uh, also ask for, white clothes, okay? All right. And so, but this also then uh, relates to, because she's playing the harlot, uh, then therefore I will return God. That's Jesus. Okay. That's Jesus who's revealed as God and, and he's coming back and he's going to take back my grain. Now I, I, I want to mention something here, not wheat. Okay. Or should I say not just wheat? There is a word that is being used here, and it is the word for grain. And there's very uh, interesting words here. So this is all of the grain at harvest time. And what's interesting about what, what grains are, uh, are, are harvested up through the harvest time? Well, I talked about that in uh, Ruth again, and that is the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. So the barley and the wheat are the grain, okay? That is the grain that is all harvested. And what I would say to you, I want you to consider that the grain, the barley and the wheat is equivalent. It is a shadow. It is a type of the body of Christ, okay? All of the grain, the barley and the wheat is all of the body. But the barley is harvested first. The wheat is harvested second. But they're all the grain harvest. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm hoping that you, you can kind of latch on to this, okay? So what I'm wanting to also point out is out of verse 9, therefore I will return and take back my grain at harvest time. So there is a harvest that takes place there. And my new wine in its season, that's not the same thing. That's a different harvest. That is a different time, right? So there is going to be another taking at that time. So that's, that's one of the things that I want you to consider. But what's interesting is he says, I will also take away my wool and my flax. Now, the way this is written, my grain, my new wine, my wool, my flax, that's all with a capital M, because that is God saying, it is my grain. It belongs to me, my new wine, my wool, my flax. Do you understand what I'm saying? So what I'm uh, trying to say here is that verse 9 is not talking about one harvest. It's talking about multiple harvests, okay? And and I find it very interesting as to the way that that works out. Oh, okay. So, and we know that it relates to timing. What timing? 
I'm going to put an end, verse 11, to all of her rejoicing, her feast, and what feast did we get there, right? He's saying that he's re they've replaced his feast with the feast of Baal later on. He says, I will replace, uh, put an end to her new moons. I will put an end to her Sabbaths and to all of her festivals. So these are all appointed times and things that are recognized, right? Because what has happened is Israel has turned away and has changed these into pagan, right? We see this now. How, how many festivals that we see are paganized? The Feast of Easter. And I, I, I don't even like to use the, I, I don't even like to speak that word, okay? Not the event that people are saying it's supposed to recognize, which is the resurrection. I want to call it the resurrection. I do not want to call it a, a pagan feast day. And I do not want to, uh, you know, get, well, we've got Christmas. And so is that recognizing a pagan day? Well, yes, conceptually, it's supposed to be recognizing the birth of, of Jesus, right? But Jesus wasn't born on that day. We know that that's a, a different day. I, and so for me, I'm not saying I'm not saying this for everyone. You, you just do what is on your heart because we have that freedom in Christ. I'm just telling you what I do. That's what I do. And so I don't want to do that. I want to recognize, and I think that this is what is happening in these days, that God's feast days, God's recommended uh, or recognized appointments, those are all coming back, right? That's part of the restoration. That's part of the restoration. And as part of that restoration is God taking his grain, taking his new wine in their, in their uh, appointed times, in their season, season, harvest time, okay? So I'm hoping that, that you will see that. So you think like, okay, well, if you can see that, let's take a look over at the church of Laodicea. Let me read that and let's see what we've got out of that, okay? So you can see this. I want to point these out, okay? So you think like, yeah, I'm just not making this up. So out of Revelation chapter 3 to the message of Laodicea. Now, I'm also reading this out of the Amplified uh, Bible so that you can, we can also continue to glean these, read them, excuse me, out of multiple translations. Compare them. Look at the Word of God. This is the English translation from the Greek, and I, I like to be able to try to get into the Hebrew, into the Greek as much as possible. That is the original language, not King's English. That the original language was Hebrew and Greek, folks. Okay, so uh, for those uh, persons that that think that you know the KJV is the perfect translation, I I don't think any translation is perfect, right? Uh, so. It, 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 unless you get to the original language, there, there's going to be issues that you need to find out about, to discuss, to go with. Anyway, so that's for another lesson. I love the King James Bible. I truly do. But sometimes it's it, it can step over itself in that uh, trying to be able to ferret out the the deeper meanings of some of the words, and especially since after hundreds of years, some of the meanings of those words, believe it or not, they've actually reversed in meaning. What they meant at the time that the KJV was written now means something completely different because language changes and that sort of thing. So it's always better to go back to the original. Amen? Right? All right. But anyway, so let's see. To uh, the angel, 
or the divine messenger of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the trusted and faithful and true witness, the beginning and origin of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold, invigorating, refreshing, nor hot, healing, therapeutic. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, spiritually useless, and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth, rejecting you with disgust. Because you say, I am rich and have prospered and grown wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked without hope and in great need. I counsel you to buy from me gold that has been heated red hot and refined by fire so that you may become truly rich and white clothes representing righteousness to clothe yourself so that the shame of your nakedness will not be seen and healing salve to put on your eyes so that you may see those who I dearly and tenderly love, I rebuke and discipline, showing them their faults and instructing them. So be enthusiastic and repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior, and seek God's will. Behold, I stand at the door of the church and continually knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, restore him, and he with me. All right, so I'm going to stop there. I'll, I'm hoping that you are seeing the connections here. I just saw them. It was so interesting. Over here, Israel's unfaithfulness. He says, I'm going to make her like a parched land and slay her with thirst. And I thought, wait a minute, here we're talking about the church of Laodicea. And, and the first things, I know that you are neither cold, invigorating, refreshing. It's, it's a drink. So if, if any of you understands, uh, nor hot, healing and therapeutic. So we understand that we, you know, if we're looking for a cold drink, right? It's, it's refreshing, invigorating. That's what it's intending. Nor hot. So if we have some hot soup or a uh, hot coffee or, you know, whatever your hot, some, something, let's say you're not feeling well and, and you want something th therapeutic and it, and, and it heats you, it warms you, it heals you, right? That's, that's what you deal. That's, that's the healing stuff that we're talking about there. The cold or hot dealing with the drink. Wow. I thought, wow, wait a minute. Okay. Slay her with thirst. And what's interesting then, the that he's going to take back the wool and the flax, and that is the white clothes. He's going to make her naked, right? And that's exactly what we see here. They don't even realize that they're naked. And he counsels them to buy from him white clothes, right? And where did we get the white clothes over here in Hosea? From the wool and the flax, right? That's where you get the white clothes. And I, I, I just, I, I think that it's it's so wonderful here. Uh, you'll also talk about uh, the taking away, the first thing that's going to happen. Uh, what I find interesting is that, therefore, I will return and take, oh, wait a minute. Okay, let, let me go back to verse 8 of chapter 2 in Hosea. For she, Israel, has not noticed nor understood nor realized that it was I, the Lord God, who gave her the grain and the new wine and the oil and lavished on her silver and gold. Okay. <clears throat> so here, once again, what we see over the church of Laodicea, that they think they are wealthy on their own. They have gotten wealthy but he is counseling them to buy gold from him 
refined in the fire. There are just so many connections that I see there. But what does uh, out of Hosea chapter 2, what do we see then in verse 9? Therefore, because of these things, because of all of the above, because of all of these things, I will return and take back my grain at harvest time and my new wine in its season. And I find that that's very interesting. So that's going to happen first, right? He's going to come back because of this, and he's going to take back uh, what belongs to him, his harvest. And what happens to the church that is right before the church of Odyssey? Well, guess what? That's the church of Philadelphia. And that is the only church that is told that they are going to be kept from the time of trial that is coming on the earth to try them that dwell on the earth. And who is that going to be? That, that would be, and this is an example, once again, the Church of Philadelphia being symbolic of the bride, but all of the seven churches are symbolic of the body. And I'm, and I'm hoping that you can see that. The whole church includes the bride, but the bride is taken out of the body. So the church of Philadelphia is taken out, but the rest of the body is left behind to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. And they will ultimately, they're not, the time of Jacob's trouble is for Jacob, okay? But there is a refining that's going to take place for the body during that beginning of the time. Now, what is that? That's a disciplining. He says that all those that I dearly and tenderly love, he dearly and tenderly loves his church. But to all of those that he dearly and tenderly loves, he rebukes and disciplines, showing them their faults and instructing them. And one of the things that he says here in this church is they need to repent, right? Right? Because they need to turn away from their sinful behavior. Now, they're a church, right? They are a church. They believe in Jesus as the Savior, but they are Wow, they don't believe that they need Jesus. Not at this point, uh, you know, this particular church. Anyway, so that's that's what I want to be able to di discuss about that. Okay, well, if that's the case, then where do you get some rapture timing out of this? All right, rapture timing. Well, there's, there's different things that we talk about as far as rapture timing goes. And, and, and as we have seen, there are people that talk about that, that keep specifying a particular day. And I believe that, that God is going to specify on his timing a particular day. Now, if, if you are a watchman, uh, a watchman or watchwoman, and you are truly watching and pointing out times to really be focusing, and I think all of the time should really be focused at this uh, at this moment in in history on Jesus coming back. Uh, and so, but here's what I would say. If you are saying a specific date, I'm not saying eventually, I mean, if you tried every one of these dates, eventually you're going to come up with the right one, right? But I also believe that, that, that we are going to be shown. And we have so much evidence of this in the Bible to be able to, to show that. So let me give you a a few examples. Uh, one that many uh, are familiar with now is out of uh, Genesis chapter 7, uh, verse 4, if I remember correctly. And that is 
where God, <clears throat> having had Noah build the ark, he tells him to get him and his family on the ark, for in seven days he's going to bring the flood. Well, he has just told him. Now, the interesting thing is, we know when we look at a calendar what day that was, but the interesting thing is he tells him how many days it's going to be till this flood comes. He tells him, I'm going to let you know in advance. But did he let him, when did he let him know? He let him know seven days before it happened. Okay. So that's, that's the interesting thing there. But he did tell him, right? So he did let him know. He knew when the flood was going to take place. It didn't catch him by surprise. Okay. Now, here's the other thing. Do we have any other instances of that? Well, the other uh, uh, other instances I've discussed it in, in other uh, messages, <clears throat> and that is Enoch. Well, now we don't get this specifically out of the timing, out of the uh, the scripture directly. We can glean that from the Book of Jubilees. Uh, which, or excuse me, the book of Jasher. Sorry, did I say Jubilee? So I've got Jubilee on the mind right at the moment. Yes. Um, and the book of Jasher, uh, chapter three, which actually discusses the timing that takes place. And interestingly enough, it works out to its seven days in advance of that taking place. And uh, I encourage you to check that out if you're if you're curious and, and to, uh, to want to... Uh, kind of get and uh, to, to glean more. Am I saying that that takes the place of scripture? No, absolutely not. But you can certainly get more information to, to help you ask Holy Spirit to be able to, uh, to give you the revelation, give you the wisdom in order to understand what it means, okay? Um, but does that happen in every instance? Or am I saying that in every instance he gives a seven-day warning. <clears throat> no, I'm not saying that. Actually, he shows in different instances different timing. And so, for example, in the book of Second uh, uh, Kings chapter 2, where we see the rapture of Elijah, then we see that it takes uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's taking some time. He's going through several different uh, places. But what we have is he's being told the day that it's going to take place. And, uh, and so uh, uh, do we have any other <clears throat> in, any other indication that it is going to happen? Well, no, we know on the day that it's going to take place, okay? Uh, we know that, but he's told the day that it's going to take place. And does it happen on that day? Yes, it happens on that day. All right. Is that all? No. Do we actually know when one of the harvests is going to take place? Yes. Yes, we do. And that was just the message that I was just given at, at the beginning of this uh, uh, live stream. And, and that is going to be, I'm going to tell you exactly what day that the mid-trib harvest is going to take place. And it's going to be yet another example of, and how do we know this? We already have it in the scripture. We are told when that's going to take place. Why? All right. I'm going to read you out of uh, Revelation chapter 11. And what this is discussing, it's discussing the two witnesses. Now, once the, uh, uh, the, uh, the harvest of the bride takes place and we go into the, the 70th week of Daniel, that starts, uh, once that starts, then what happens is there's going to be two witnesses that's going to appear in Jerusalem, 
right? And they are going to be speaking. They're going to be given the testimony of Jesus in Jerusalem, okay? That's what they're going to be doing. And they're going to be giving it to the Jews there in Jerusalem. It can't be more obvious than that. At the same time, we've got 144,000 evangelists. Now, they have come from the 12 tribes, but they are all over the world, right? I don't think that <clears throat> we know that, <clears throat> excuse me, originally, uh, thank you, uh, that the 12 tribes were scattered, right, during the diaspora. And I think that all of these that are being sealed, um, they, they're they still going to be all over the world. And they, so it's not like they all get together and they go, look like, oh, I'm from Asher. Are we good? Uh, Nepali? Oh, yeah, it's good. it's good to see you, brother. Uh, it's not going to be, I don't think, like that. What it's going to be is that they are going to be sealed. They are going to be known of God, specifically who they are. <clears throat> and those people are going to be sealed and they are going to be witnessing the world over. And then those people, the church that is left behind, they are also going to be filled with a double portion of Holy Spirit. They are going to be doing these mighty works and things Greater works than these, I think. That that's what I believe that that's what Jesus was pointing to at this time that's going to happen then. But anyway, getting back to what's going to happen then is all the way up to the middle of the tribulation, we've got these two witnesses that are uh, prophesying. And how long do they prophesy for? 1260 days three and a half years, okay? Now, these these are real people, okay? So it's not like some kind of strange thing. It says that they are in Jerusalem. So it, it is a real <clears throat> two people, I think that, uh, and, and it says two witnesses, they're in Jerusalem. So there are others that say, well, no, it's, it's the church. And not all church doesn't fit in Jerusalem. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. All right, but let me, we're talking about timing. All right, let me read you out of uh, uh, Revelation 11. And I'm, I'm going to read you down, uh, wow, to verse 11. 11, 11, folks. Okay, think about this. All right. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. Now, this is out of King James Version. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall be tread underfoot 40 and two months, three and a half years. Okay. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now, why am I saying that there's lots of reasons why I say there are some people that believe that the two witnesses are prophesying in the second half of the tribulation period. And, uh, and I don't believe that is the case. Uh, I believe that because the days are shortened, this is one example that I have, because the days are being shortened during the second half, uh, that doesn't fit here because we are told specifically that they prophesy 1260 days. And so their days can't be shortened. Okay. So they have to prophesy all of those days. And this makes sense. So follow here and see it. The two olive trees, <clears throat> these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. They have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. 
And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. This is the, the Antichrist, right? <clears throat> and shall overcome them and kill them. Verse 8, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, this evening, right, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, no doubt, Jerusalem. Verse 9, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the graves. Three and a half days. But what happens after three and a half days? Once they die, three and a half days later, what happens? And they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets taunted them that dwelt on the earth. Now that's, that's again, so here do we know that there are two people? He says there are two prophets right here, right? All right, verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In that same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. That's the rapture. That's the mid-tribulation rapture, folks. That is going to happen after the witnesses are, are excuse me, uh, I think that that is what's going to happen at that mid-tribulation rapture. Uh, what happens is that, um, I think that what happens is that the Antichrist, he declares himself to be God. He's given power over them in the middle of this tribulation. He's able to overcome and kill the two witnesses, okay? All right. And what is that? That is the sign for the counting. That is a three and a half day warning because what happens after three and a half days? They are fractured. And that is, uh, and there's a, an earthquake. And we know that uh, resurrections seem to be accompanied by earthquakes. Okay. So we have an earthquake in that same hour, right? And uh, that's what happens there. So I think that that's what we have. So is God. Is he able to give them uh, a warning uh, about when the mid-trib rapture would take place? I think so. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and I think that that is exactly what's happening here. So what is the sign that, that, that they look for? Okay, well, three and a half days after the two prophets are killed, then they're going to live up. They're going to be raised on their feet. And we're going to hear... The call from heaven, just like in the other instance, come up here, just like in Revelation 4, verse 1. That is a pre-trib uh, rapture there. Come up here, and immediately I was in the spirit. Here is the mid-trib, and we know the timing that that's going to take place, right? So what do we all say now? What do we all say now? So is that a timing is God giving us a timing for a harvest? Well, specifically, we have that timing. We know exactly when that will happen. We've already been given that in advance. Do we have then the timing that is given to us as far as the pre-trib harvest? Well, I haven't been given that. Uh, there are others that are saying this. I think we are so close that, I mean, I can taste it. It's that it's that close. Um, and I think that we are going to be told. And how do I know this? Well, let me close by this. Because when I went back to sleep at 530 this morning, I had another dream. 
And in that dream, Jesus told me, Jesus told me, I had another God dream. And Jesus told me that he would tell us when that day would take place. And that's all there was to that dream. And I'll tell you what, whether, you know, for you or, or not, but I can tell you what it meant for me. I believe Jesus. I believe his word. And I believe what he says that according to Amos 3, 7, that he is not going to do anything that he hasn't revealed to his servants, the prophets. It's in that word. I just showed you one of them. <clears throat> and I think, excuse me, that we're going to see the other ones as well. So take heart, brothers and sisters. We are so close to going home. We are so close. If you don't know Jesus, you really don't have a whole lot of time left. You might be able to have an opportunity at the second harvest, but I don't think you want to wait for that. If you don't know Jesus right now, that's going to make, make it very tough for you because the only, the only ones that know Jesus are the ones that are going to make any harvest, right? And, uh, and I'm, I'm telling you that that's what's going to, going to take place. And, you know, it is not going to end well, to put it lightly, if you die without Jesus. You don't want to do that. He doesn't want you to do that. That's what the most important thing is. He doesn't want you to do that. He loves you so much. You could not possibly understand just how deep his love for you is. So I'm telling you that right now what you can do is you can be saved. And what does that mean? That means that you understand that Jesus is God. He came down from heaven, was born a man in a fleshy body. He lived a sinless life and died as a sacrifice for your sin for our sin, for everybody's sin, because we can't pay that debt. doesn't matter if you try. You can't do it. Only a sinless sacrifice can do that. And that's why Jesus had to die himself. And he did it out of love for you. He was buried, and three days later, he rose from the dead. He conquered death by doing that. And if you believe that. You put all of your trust in that. You can say, Jesus, forgive me. I, I want that free gift that you offer for me. I want that right now. Cleanse me, cover me, take my sin. I don't want it. I want your free gift of life. Renew me, restore me, make me new. Do that for me now. Come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. Do this now. I trust you. I believe you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sin. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to hear about it. I want to welcome you to the family. And so soon now, we are going to be called up. Amen, brothers and sisters. All right. Be encouraged. I love you all. I'll see you in the clouds. Maranatha. Bye-bye now.